Welcome to Breathe California TV. My name is Terry Trumbull. Breathe California is a lung health organization throughout the state of California. Today we're going to be talking about green ninjas. Yeah, I really did mean green ninjas. We're talking with Professor Eugene Cordero of the Meteorology Department at San Jose State. All will be revealed in 30 seconds. I have asthma, and so asthma, like, I can't do that many sports because I, like, wheeze and then I have to take my inhaler. I, I can't do a lot of things other kids can do. What I learned at asthma camp is how to treat your asthma and, like, don't, don't hold back if you have asthma. Brief California has made it easier for me to play sports and do other things that I couldn't do before. Welcome back. This is Breathe California TV. My name is Terry Trumbull. I'm a volunteer. Hopefully you're watching this every Thursday night here in San Jose and Campbell, but tell your mommy back in uh, Arkansas and you can watch this on createtvsj.org anytime. So last year, Breathe California, just in this county, helped 150,000 people with breathing difficulties. But this show focuses on how to prevent damage to your lungs. Obviously smoking, but uh, it may amuse you to learn that most of our problems are air pollution related. So today we're talking about uh, air pollution, climate change, which to a major degree are the same, unless Eugene tells me otherwise, uh, with Eugene Cordero, Professor of Meteorology at San Jose State. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So can I get away with saying air pollution and climate change are the same thing? Well, they're not technically the same thing, but I think that it's a, it's a good segue into thinking about those issues quite similarly. I mean, air pollution, I often tell my students, you have a car that's, that's moving along, and the stuff you see coming out of it, you know, it's kind of nasty stuff. You, you wouldn't want to put your mouth around the tailpipe. I mean, you know intuitively something's funny with that. Um, but the stuff you don't see, and that is air pollution that's, that's bad for your lungs. The stuff you don't see is carbon dioxide, which is a heat-trapping gas, which is responsible largely for our changing climate. And so we do see that nasty stuff coming out. It's bad for our lungs. Climate change is also bad for our health as well, indirectly by making air pollution worse, by making the climate warmer or more unstable, by rising sea level, all that stuff. So I, I, I do lump them together as well. So the reason I was uh, saying that is just to get you and I to be a little bit provocative here at the start. Uh, it may be where your Green Ninja program got uh, their award. Breathe California does for the th entire Bay some awards. And the regional head of EPA came in and said, 85% of the population agrees that we've got to reduce our use of fossil fuel and start um, attacking air pollution because it's a health issue. And in terms of supporting alternative energy and energy conservation, it's 80%. But at the time he made the speech, it was mid-50s on climate change. And what everybody doesn't really understand is they're both about reducing our energy use. That's definitely true. So the, the type of solutions that everyone is talking about, Brief California and many other groups, are about conservation, about other ways to move around, about your energy use at the home, um, and even about the foods you eat. So all of those, I would say the solutions to most of those are, are come together in terms of air pollution and climate change. And so they're really kind of similar. Well, there's some risk with you and I being on the program. The program has always been accused of being too academic, and you and I can start arguing on those sort of things. But what do you think of an approach that the EPA regional administrator, should we confront and sell the public directly on climate change? Or should we approach it more tangentially and reduce our energy use and focus on the health effects on, on people? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think that, that the issue of climate change, although as you and I both know very well, there is controversy about it. I mean, 20 or 30 years ago, there was scientific controversy, very serious. Um, today, the science is, is very clear, uh, and yet, you know, for some reason, 
there's still a lot of controversy. And even within the Republican Party, many of the front runners say that climate change isn't happening or the humans aren't responsible, which violates the science that NASA, the National Academy of Sciences, you know, all the respected scientific agencies in this country. I, I'm somewhat an optimist, but I believe that will change, that that's just a kind of temporary like diversion outside of the realm of science. Well, and, one can only hope that. I mean, I'm kind of reminded that we put late 50s, early 60s warnings on cigarettes and the tobacco industry kept telling us there was no risk yeah. until the 90s. Is that a worthwhile analogy? Very. In fact, some of the same players and very similar techniques, the techniques to, to promote uncertainty, to say, oh, we need to study this further, or uh, there's other people that are saying something different. Uh, but, but I think that, in, in going back to your original question, that talking about climate change is actually important, as well as talking about clean and healthy living. And, and with our Green Ninja Project and with the education work that we do, we do talk about climate change because, you know, people increasingly, Americans are becoming concerned about it. I mean, we just signed on to this Paris Agreement, an international agreement, which was kind of our first real um, step in that direction about, well, let's do something about it. And so I do think that the, in the Bay Area, we should be talking about it, and for our work, especially in our schools. Yeah, I think it's imperative. So um, I'm a lawyer and a policy guy by, by background. You have expanded from originally being a doctorate in um, science. Yeah. Um, how would you respond to the scientific changes? I am not phrasing this well, but when I first started working in 1970 in, for the National EPA implementing the Clean Air Act, we said God's gift to the world is if everything we burned was just water and carbon dioxide. Mm. And yeah. somewhere along the line, we got to this spot where you said a little earlier, carbon dioxide's a pollutant. What? What's with that? Yeah. So, I mean, and I think it was around, you know, it's been 30, 40 years. People have known that, that too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere could potentially warm the planet. Um, but we really, in the last 30 years, have identified how important that is compared to other things that are happening. Uh, so it would be, you know, it is a, a natural gas in the atmosphere, and we enjoy the benefits of water vapor and carbon dioxide. It keeps the planet nice and comfy. Uh, and yet... Now we are understanding very clearly that too much of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is also not going to be good. Um, so our science does evolve. Um, but this is not, you know, obviously a new story. And so we've been studying climate change, you know, for the last 30 years and, and I think have developed a pretty good understanding of what's going on. Yeah, the, there's a, a book that was written by a physicist as a science fiction writer, UC Irvine professor Gregory Benford. And it was about a faster-than-light particle um, so that in 2015, scientists on Earth sent a message back that arrived in 1968 to Earth telling us that climate change is a terrible problem and we needed to do something about it. And nobody did anything. So to ring any familiar tones. Yeah. The story I like to tell my students, yeah. or, or anyone who will listen, is that we had a similar issue related to ozone depletion. Absolutely. And it continues today, but we have recognized the issue scientifically. We designed some policy solutions, and we're starting to see the ozone layer recover, which is, which is great news. But uh, some of my colleagues, I was a postdoc at NASA Goddard in, in Washington, D.C. area, uh, have run some climate model simulations with chemistry, and they said, what if we didn't have the Montreal Protocol? What if we didn't have this international agreement to phase out ozone-depleting chemicals? What would life be like on the planet in the year 2050? And the results are, are pretty shocking. We would have lost half of our ozone layer, and, and someone like you or me, if we went outside in 2050, in the middle of the day, we could be sunburned in five minutes. So we really could have messed up our planet. And yet we didn't, and, the, and so that's the kind of good news, is that we can do something from an international perspective to avert an environmental catastrophe. And now we're faced again with, a, with an, another challenge that, that in some ways might be more difficult because there isn't a simple one fix, like f phase out these types of chemicals and produce some alternatives. Well, um, I keep uh, 
I have a wonderful uh, producer of the show named Carlos Escobar put together questions for you, and they're a lot more fun than what I've been <laughs> talking about. But uh, I just can't help uh, wanting to pick your brain because of your expertise in climate science. First, do you think what Jerry Brown told the Pope, you know, the Pope had a conference, I'm guessing, in October, you may know the date, mm -hmm. and Brown said some of the effects have already happened, we can't reverse them, we need to get jumping now. Yeah. Um, one, do you think that's accurate, and two, most people like to be more optimistic and act like, well, gosh, if we just got jumping, we could prevent all mm -hmm. this. So. A, is it true, and which is the best way to solve just, the problem? I'll, I'll just tell you a little story. So Sustainable Silicon Valley, an organization here, uh, had a, a conference a couple years ago at NASA Ames, and, uh, and they had a special guest, Jerry Brown, came in with all his handlers and came in the back door and spoke to a group of, of a lot of scientists when we were there, and he had no notes, and he told us about climate change and the potential impacts, and he was very sharp. I was yeah. like, wow. That dude knows what's going on. Um, and, it, and I remember thinking, this is probably like three or four years ago, if half of what he says should be done, if he could work in that direction, that would be pretty impressive. And I have been very impressed with him in the last couple of years in terms of, of what the, the state of California is, is going to do about this. Um, certainly, the oceans have already heated up a lot. And, and that heat is eventually going to go into the atmosphere. So we're already um, committed to some additional warming, some additional sea level rise. Um, and, you know, our trajectory is not, we, with the emissions keep going up and concentration continues, and so to, to change that with 7 billion people on the planet is going to be difficult. So I think that California really is on the leading edge of actually doing something. And so the plans that came out of legislation last year, which were to uh, increase our use of renewable energy, are right on board. I mean, they're pretty aggressive. Um, and also there was a also to try to reduce petroleum use, which didn't get through, but Brown said we're going to try it again this year. Um, that's, we do really need to shift our economy away from fossil fuels. And yeah, it's going to be difficult, and uh, maybe it's going to cost a little bit more, um, but luckily we're seeing solar prices go down, we're seeing uh, wind doing pretty well, uh, and, and also this kind of excitement of people like Elon Musk, who we could argue about who the most influential CEO in Silicon Valley is right now. But, Definitely, he has a vision of, of moving to um, a cleaner energy economy. And, and for some people, and that's really exciting. Well, you, I'm just going to make a quick comment on him. You think about it, we're supposed to think, you know, ask a typical student when they start my energy policy class, where is all the new automotive technology coming from? And they all think it's probably from Detroit. You know, and it's here. Yeah. And somebody that really got out and was willing to bet the ranch, the money he made from other startups, it's amazing. So let me just finish the Jerry Brown story mm -hmm. and see if you agree. My summary of what you just said was, sure, we've had effects, but that doesn't mean, A, that we can't do something about them now, and B, that they might get reversed. And the Montreal situation with the ozone layer may be a good yeah, example of that. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, there are some impacts that, that we're going to have to just deal with in California. And the reduction in snowpack is one of them. This is actually the weather that we're experiencing in the last few days has been very warm. Haven't it's had been absolutely ideal, which means it's terrible. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and it's really interesting because this is a very strong El Nino year we're in. And so California is like, you know, praying, hope we get a lot of rain because we've been in this heavy drought. And yet, this is, we're at, at for the state, we are at average for a normal year. Yeah. And yet, this is our big El Nino. So are we moving into this real drier kind of um, climate? But regardless of whether that happens or not, we're definitely moving into a warmer climate. And that means more rain compared to snow. And so our sear snowpack is going to continue to decline. And so California's going to have to figure out what to do about that. But some of this is reversible, and, and what choice do we have? I mean, when I teach my, yeah. my classes, um, I could really depress our students with 15 weeks worth of kind of doom and gloom about what we're doing to our environment. Uh, and I do that for a few weeks. But I really want to focus on like solutions, because 
that's what gets people excited, and that's what gives us hope, and that's what gives us the opportunity to like do something about it. And I think it's actually really exciting that we're going to have to change our economy, we're going to have to change our infrastructure in terms of transportation and housing, we have to figure out how to live more in urban cores, and you know, and, and those things are going to be... And all of that makes our lives better. And actually, yeah. it's not going to make our lives worse, right? Yeah. That we're going to have cleaner air and cleaner water, and we might get to know our neighbors more and, and move around easier. Um, I think it could be a Sounds good thing. Sounds pretty doggone good. So I promised you we'd be talking about green ninjas, and here we are halfway through the show, haven't done it. So Professor Cordero and I will be back, and I promise you green ninjas. What it feels like to have an asthma attack is, well, you can't breathe and you can't tell anybody that you're having an asthma attack because you, you can hardly talk. You can maybe say one or two words, but you can't say much else. Breathe California has helped me come in contact with more asthmatics and more people who have the same case as I do. It's important to me because I don't feel like I'm alone in the fight against asthma. Welcome back. We're talking with Professor Eugene Cordero of the Meteorology Department at San Jose State. But I think your um, blurb under your title, When They See You Right Now, has climate change in it. So talk a little bit about your role in meteorology and climate change. Yeah, so I mean, I have a degree, a PhD in atmospheric science, and I came to the Department of Meteorology. Um, but I was, I'm more of a focused climate scientist. And then in that time, we've actually changed our title in our department to Department of Meteorology and Climate Science, as climate science becomes more and more important. Uh, but my background is focused on looking at uh, long-term observations of how the climate has changed in the past, and especially looking at climate models and their projections of the past and future to try to understand you know, what really is going on. And for me, most importantly, like what's going to happen in the future. Well, and you also mentioned off air that to do this, you're combining both pure science and policy, social types of issues, because identifying the problem is one thing, but for you to solve the problem, you've got to go into other areas. Yeah, and so for me, as, a, as someone who looks at climate models and, and the projections for the future, policy is right in there, because if we look at the next 50 years, um, there's lots of different possible futures for us, and policy plays a really strong role in that. And I think that looking at the business as usual scenarios or that we don't pay much attention um, offered a real bleak uh, outcome for our planet over the next hundred years. And that kind of led me to think, gosh, is there something, I, something else I should be doing besides just studying the science? Is there something else I could do to try to make things a little better? So we promised everybody green ninjas. What in the heck's that got to do with anything here? It's got a lot to do, at least it's got a lot to do with my life. Um, I'll just give you a little a quick backstory. It was about eight years ago, one of my friends, um, who is a chef and environmental food activist, uh, decided that she wanted to write a book about food and climate change. And I'm the only climate scientist she happened to know. <laughs> so she said, will you help me write this book? Yeah. And so we wrote a, a hybrid cookbook, science book. It's called Cool Cuisine, Taking the Bite Out of Global Warming. And it was about how food choices have an impact on our climate and environment, and how you can cook your way to a happier and lower carbon footprint lifestyle. And that kind of led me, that altered my trajectory from being basically a pure scientist to someone who was looking at, at solutions as well. And after we published our book and I gave talks about food and climate change to many groups, I noticed that one group that was missing from the libraries that I was visiting or the coffee shops were young people, especially students. And we had told some very interesting stories about, like for example, burritos. And I don't know if yeah. you're a fan of burritos, but, but I am, and the carbon footprint of different flavors of burritos and, and, and some mm -hmm. stories like that. So I pitched those ideas to faculty in the film and animation departments at San Jose State, and they helped me invent this a Green Ninja character, an actual superhero, um, that it has a storyline that basically helps kids become interested and engaged around solutions to climate change. And so we started using this Green Ninja, these stories, and we made now already 32 short films about the adventures of, of a Green Ninja character or, or kind of related characters. 
um, that we use in schools and we develop in curriculum and programs around those films. And they're live action and animated and use puppets and music videos and really kind of quirky um, films that use humor as a kind of a bridge. And, and this is so much better than you and I as talking heads like we were the last 20 minutes. It appeals yeah. to a different audience. Yeah. And, and our goal is to appeal to middle school and maybe mm -hmm. high school, especially middle school is, is our target, but also kind of in a way that Disney does is that older folks might find it interesting and, and quirky too. And so that use of humor to address a really challenging environmental issue um, and, and really talking about solutions is kind of our philosophy behind our Green Ninja character. I, I want to get back to Green Ninja, but I want to make a quick plug for San Jose State's art program, which this week just started uh, an art program on use of garbage for usual, uh, more useful things, you know, reduce, reusing, recycle, and it included a boat in uh, fishing in Thailand completely made of old water bottles. So go down there and see that because San Jose State is doing a lot of good things and the new uh, president we have has uh, reincarnated a sustainable program and so the campus is, is getting on the cutting edge. So back to Green Ninjas. Um, under your name, when people look at it right now, you say go contact me at Eugene at Green Ninja dot org. Oh, so what are they going to find if they go there? Yeah, so if you go to our Green Ninja website, uh, you'll find all our videos. Um, but you'll also find that, oh, there's educational materials there, especially for teachers or for people who are homeschooling their, their children. And that's really, that's our goal, is to use our Green Ninja character and story as superhero um, to engage students in the classroom around real science that's related to the environment. And so uh, we put little Easter eggs in the films, little science tidbits that might not be uh, normally noticed. Like, I'll give you an example. In one of our first films, um, the Green Ninja runs by this big Hummer and converts it into a tandem bicycle, right? <laughs> and Good. then there's a little bumper sticker on the tandem bicycle, and it says 26 MPB. And then the you know, screen moves on. And that 26 MPB is a little lesson, miles per burrito. And then, so, and, and then there's a whole lesson around, oh, how far can you go on a burrito's worth of energy? And, and what are the carbon emissions associated with that? So that's an example of an Easter egg that we put in there. Um, and so we describe some of that on our website, is we have an episode guide for every episode, and then we have a discussion guide that teachers could use in their classroom to help their students not just watch the film, but kind of get something else out of it. And right now, the exciting news is we're developing a one-year curriculum for middle school that meet the new standards, the next generation science standards, um, that use Green Ninja films. We have some games now. We have a couple Green Ninja games and then some Green Ninja um, programs, which include filmmaking and storytelling, having, helping students tell their own stories about um, solutions to climate change. And we're putting that all together in a one-year curriculum. And this is just spectacular. I headed a state agency for six years under the youngest governor in the state's history, some guy called Jerry Brown. Mm. And um, so we developed curriculum for third and sixth graders and high school on encouraging recycling, reduce, reuse, yeah. recycle, and extremely effective. And the dilemma was the next conservative Republican successor threw it all out and it never surfaced again. The nice thing in your case is you're not dependent on turnovers in, in government. Yeah, in fact, our goal is to really, really help teachers address these new standards. Um, climates, the, so the exciting news is the new standards include climate change, human impact, and engineering design as key elements of, of learning science. And so all, there's going to be about 30 million kids who are going to have to learn about climate change in, in the United States. And we want to help those kids grow up learning about not just the science, but like what are we going to do about it? and actually ultimately help them become active in their own homes and communities and, and give them the schools, the, the, the techniques and experience designing solutions. So that's really our goal there. So I hope everybody watches next week when we're going to be talking about getting people involved with Chelsea Busick, one of my uh, students, because that ultimately to me is the secret to addressing 
all of our problems is have people taking charge of their own lives. Yeah. We have a, we're doing a little research study on campus right now mm -hmm. where we, we taught a, a class on campus, a one-year class, where students really got a chance to do something about climate change. And now we're interviewing those students five years later after they've graduated to see how it influences their lives. And our preliminary results show that those students have reduced their, their carbon footprint and they're, and they're much more environmentally aware than, normal, than regular students. And we're offering this as an example of how impactful um, education could potentially be if it's designed uh, properly, which is our goal with middle school kids. So any of you um, who are parents, make sure your kids are environmental studies or climate change majors, because uh, they'll have a big impact. So just talk about that a little bit more. One of the things I try to wave around is what you said about Jerry Brown. Just because at the national level we're confused, we have more than 30 states and 5,000 cities that are doing things, and yeah. if none of them were doing it, you and I could, and everybody watching this could do something. Certainly, you know, it's great when you have a supportive governor, a supportive Congress, a president, um, but, you know, for, for quite a few years we didn't have that, and so local groups were doing a lot. Um, and, and making real impact. So one thing we're learning about climate change is that, okay, it's happening, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna intensify, but we're gonna have to figure out how to be resilient, how to keep our local communities clean and healthy, and, and also how to transition to this lower carbon economy. Um, so we really are hearing you make a difference in climate change and a lot of other things. So we've been talking with uh, Professor Eugene Cordero uh, climate scientist. I hope you'll follow up and see what he's got on his website. See you next week.